Hi, welcome to Danville's first Blackboard Sessions. Uh, my name is Al Clark. I'll be today's presenter. Um, Blackboard Sessions were kind of inspired um, by my staff in that uh, if you've ever worked at Danville and we have a, a situation where somebody, you know, I want to explain something and I always seem to bring them into my office and start drawing pictures and and squiggly lines and so forth to try to explain things. So, so our marketing staff thought that this is kind of a natural way for me to present ideas, uh, primarily about topics of DSP and digital audio. Maybe a few times we'll do things that are a little bit outside that uh, with other things audio. Uh, but I hope you find this is useful to you and let's continue. So marketing put this slide together. Um, it kind of reminds me of when your mother brings out your baby pictures. So I'll probably find a, a way to get my vengeance back on, on marketing a little bit later. But the reason this slide probably is here is that I've been doing high-end audio for a long time. This was, picture was taken actually from Minnesota Monthly Magazine in I think 1976 or 7 when I was uh, designing high high performance preamplifiers and power amplifiers. So I started out as an analog engineer and have done that for perhaps 45 years. Uh, I was just out of my probably just finished college by the time this picture was taken. In 1990 I started doing DSP with first generation DSPs. So when it comes to digital audio and DSP audio I've, I'm a bit long in the tooth and I uh, am a, a bit grayer now and don't have quite those kind of lapels and suits. So let's move on. So this topic is going to be why DSP crossovers and more importantly why uh, active DSP crossovers. Um, I'm not going to spend really any time talking at length of what distinguishes an active versus a passive crossover. Most of you already know this. But just to summarize real quickly, an active crossover is set up in such a way that you have the filtering first, followed by a series of amplifiers usually connected to each driver. And then the, and then the driver in your loudspeaker takes over. The a passive loudspeaker simply has a single power amplifier driving some form of collection of typically R's, C's, and L's, you know, resistors, inductors, capacitors and then your speakers at the other end and of course most traditional loudspeakers have been built using that format. Um, what we're going to talk about today is why why you would uh, want to go another route. There's a lot of reasons why a DSP crossover and generally uh, we're going to talk about DSP crossovers and active crossovers as being the same. An active crossover could be all analog, it doesn't have quite as many uh, of the same uh, benefits, so it's a subset of what we can talk about here. When I was preparing this, this came from actually a prep, uh, a presentation that Paul Beckman of DSP Concepts and I did a number of years ago at a uh, Alma show, which is uh, a group of loudspeaker manufacturers, and it was part of a two-hour course. But when I first started looking at some of this, and you can see this today. I would find that people would say, well, passives are good and actives are good, and it kind of just depends. And I think these were mostly written by loudspeaker manufacturers who have a line of quite a few passive loudspeakers. Uh, what you're going to find is that, from my point of view, there's very, very little benefit to a passive crossover. So this is a far more partisan point of view. I would say an active an active crossover, whether it's DSP or purely analog, has tremendous advantages over any kind of passive crossover. And we're going to talk about a number of those today. Uh, and not all of them, frankly. There's still more, but these are a good set of them. So if there's an advantage of a passive crossover, this is probably the only slide I have that shows it. And let me explain what this means. If you look over here, at this red line right here. That represents uh, the passive crossover case. And I'm going to explain what this, these, this simple graph means. The simplest crossover I might have would be maybe no crossover at all. In other words, kind of a null set where I have a single 
driver and it's hooked up to an amplifier and I call it a speaker an intercom speaker perhaps or something like that and so it costs nothing and its performance is obviously quite low I can start adding components um, and at some point I can just spend as much money as I like but I really can't improve the performance very far with a passive crossover so that's kind of what this red curve represents I keep adding some parts you know some inductors some capacitors and so forth but I very quickly hit the wall of what I can do with that crossover no matter how much money I spend <clears throat> so the advantage is if your if your cost constraints are somewhere in this region over here this is the area where and your performance requirements are in that region this is the one area where a passive crossover has advantages because it's less expensive up to a certain point a, a DSP crossover starts or even in any active crossover but generally a DSP crossover starts with a fixed cost you know I have a DSP I have some data converters you know DAC certainly uh, some other components and whether I do one filter or do a hundred filters I've kind of sunk my money into that system so the cost is kind of it is what it is you've got a kind of an Andy in and you can do all sorts of things until you can't until you run out of MIPS or something and that's why this curve moves very abruptly up so if I wanted to make that crossover a little bit better I might spend a bit more money maybe I've used better data converters faster DSPs etc and and therefore I have a, a higher sunk fund cost but at some point I can do a lot more performance until once again somewhere I hit the wall and in today's world I'd say that hitting that wall is um, you know we're talking hundreds of filters if you really wanted to go that far we're talking about incredibly good data converters today that are almost you know routinely have signal to noises you know in the 100 130 db range even uh, certainly in the 120s which is you know a thousand times better than say the noise of the vinyl record um, and and so uh, I would say that DSP components whether it's the processors or the converters have gotten good enough that they're not really uh, a fundamental reason why you can't get really great results so when I think of a DSP crossover the first thing I think about is the fact that you can kind of do a whole lot of things that you wouldn't normally have considered simple to do because your constraints are far less limited uh, we're going to talk about some of these more in detail but um, the you know the fact that I can generate the frequency response or phase response or combinations thereof with a tremendous amount of accuracy if I choose to is all possible with a DSP solution today I can del um, do delay compensation I can do I can reconfigure it so that I have one configuration um, for one set of circumstances this happens a lot in studio monitors for example where I have something called voicing where maybe I want this is my high performance set and this is what it sounds like when it's in a boom box um, and maybe you want to listen to those and maybe you've changed the equalization other parameters to give you some idea of, of uh, how this per perform in different environments so this is probably the, one of the easiest ones to illustrate uh, on the on the right side here I've got a pair of Bowers and Wilkins DM6s these were loudspeakers that were produced in the 1970s I actually uh, owned a pair of these at one point and it's a good one to show how time alignment might be done mechanically because what you can see here is a tweeter a mid-range and a woofer and if we kind of drew a line right through the center here following my cursor their acoustical centers were designed mechanically to line up so that the content coming out of each driver would arrive at the same time so that's a form of time alignment but of course it's more difficult to create a cabinet that way than certainly a, a more rectangular box so that's why I call this the hard way uh, but it was a way of, of creating time alignment uh, if you know where the acoustical centers are in a DSP it's really quite trivial because we simply add a delay line so if the content from the woofer would normally be coming out a little bit later because under a, in a, a more typical box the voice coils back here somewhere and the tweeters would be more close to the surface 
we would delay the tweeter and, and the mid-range a little bit less so that uh, all the way fronts would come out the, the drivers at the same time. This is probably one of my favorite curves and it's a little bit exaggerated. So it's, I want to think of this as a conceptual drawing and not necessarily a real speaker measurement. But if we were measuring a loudspeaker and we wanted to correct the, the basically the peaks and the valleys, you know, let's say that we wanted flat direct sound as our, our metric, for example. Um, and we've made some measurement and we've got some things that are higher than our than than our perfect middle here, if you will, this line here, and others that are below it. In a passive crossover, all we really can do is push these peaks down. So we're we're chomping down here, we're pushing down here, and so forth. But these nulls, there's no way of pushing those back up. So we're basically uh, pushing everything down. So in this particular case, if we were just pushing the peaks and this was our nominal level represented by this brown line I'm going across here, we would have a response that went this way and then dipped and then this way and dipped and so forth. Or we'd keep moving this line down and we just keep scrunching all this stuff. So, so the, the catch to that is that, um, you know, that's not really a very satisfactory correction. So if I took the same idea, next slide, and imagine this wasn't drawn freehand and this and these peaks and valleys were a bit more symmetrical. Then if my response to the loudspeaker is represented first in the blue like this for this little section we're talking about, and I put a and I set a, a filter that was the inverse of this blue one, which is represented by the brown sections here, albeit not drawn perfectly. Then if I put those two together, I would have a composite that'd be pretty much a flat line right down the center here like this. And, and that's fundamentally what we try to do with a DSP. I mean, not to make it absolutely perfect, it's probably not a great idea, but to make it fundamentally say flat for direct sound. And we can do that by using um, either IIR type filters which are basically parametric EQs and put a bunch of them together and and that can be quite a large number of them if you wanted them to be. Or we could use some kind of finite impulse response filters, FIR filters, in which case, um, once again, I, it's another type of filter that doesn't have a, a very good analog. Um, um, analog. So the fundamental thing is, is that we can get the response we want. And this showing frequency response, but in principle, there's nothing that says that this couldn't also be addressing phase response. So we're moving to another topic, and this is, this is going to take a little bit of a thought exercise, and I'll try to explain this a little bit better. Um, so let's just say that we were listening to two signals, a low frequency signal, and a higher frequency signal. Now I realize that most of us don't listen to two tones through our loudspeakers as a matter of musical appreciation, but it's an easy way to, exp to explain uh, a problem. So imagine these are two signals that I that I'm that I care about. If I if when they're mixed together, this is what that signal looked like. So what I really have is I have this low frequency. Um, with the high frequencies riding on top, sort of like a wave with the white caps on top of the waves. And most of the energy is maybe in the waves, but the white caps carry the, the high frequencies. And so this would be sort of like a signal coming out of your power amplifier that traditionally would be going into your loudspeaker system. And let's assume that we just hit a big bass note. And what happens then is that this in, in, in this particular big bass note and the amplifier is insufficient. So if you notice here across the tops and across the bottoms, I've started to clip. And clipping in any kind of amplifier is not particularly good. So it has nothing to do with whether it's class A, whether it's vacuum tube, whether it's class D, whatever. Clipping is not good. So an amplifier and clipping is no longer a good amplifier. What you also see is that bass note where a lot of the energy is, basically doesn't pay the price in all cases. Sometimes it's the high frequencies that pay the price and if the amplifier is being asked to produce all those signals. So you just hit this big bass note and all of a sudden, you know, the the higher you know the strings now sound awful. 
or a chime or whatever it happens to be in the, our little example. Or in our case, our, sec our high frequency tone just got clipped and it just became brighter because we generated a whole bunch of um, odd harmonics. So the conclusion that I wanted to bring up with this particular shot is pretty simple. If this was a DSP crossover or an active crossover, then the low frequency would have been in one set of channels and the high frequencies would have been in another and that chances of those two things interacting like this become minimized because if I had actually driven that low frequency all the way to the extremes, there's no opportunity for the high frequencies to have clipped because they're handled by a completely different signal chain with its own amplifier. So this is another reason why uh, an active system can sound so much better. It's just due to the fact that each area is, is separated by uh, independently. One of the things we haven't talked about is the fact that uh, what DSP or active crossovers can do and what they can't do. So the first thing to consider is that a DSP is not going to get rid of nonlinearities in your system. If your loudspeaker drivers are distorting, they're distorting. Find a way to use a different driver or use that driver in a way that it works better. Uh, likewise, if your dispersion is really poor, the DSP is not going to fix your dispersion. Um, so the DSP isn't going, isn't a panacea to, to make a, a bad loudspeaker system a great one. It, if, it's, if it's crap, it's still crap. Uh, but it can take a good loudspeaker that's fundamentally linear and has good directional response uh, and make it a better one. And that's what our goal is. And so there are a number of ways that happens. And one of the things we want to make sure we're doing is not creating new problems uh, that happen in a practical system, a passive system that we can get rid of. So one of them is power amps. So power amps, no matter how you build a power amp, whatever technology you like, are not perfect devices. We all know this. We keep on striving for better ones all the time and we, we've made progress as an industry on that, but they're not perfect devices. So if we can make the, the job of the power amplifier easier, for instance, if a power amp is driving uh, the driver directly rather than the crossover, like a passive crossover, or when the signals are far more band limited, which happens in an active crossover because maybe it's only handling the bass notes or the tweeter uh, sections or whatever, then the amplifier is effectively got an easier job and the amplifier will tend to do much better. So multiple amplifiers uh, can sound a lot better than one big perfect amplifier that no matter how much money is in your budget, you will not buy. Um, second thing is, is that uh, the drivers themselves are not constant. So as they get warm, because maybe you're listening to music loud, uh, their characteristics change. This is something that uh, Clipple and others have talked extensively about. And that means that whatever crossover you design as your passive crossover is not likely to be the same crossover when it's warm than when it's cold because the two interact. Um, when you're driving directly with an amplifier, you effectively have a very, very high damping factor. The amplifier's impedance is low the trans relative to the transducer. And if the transducer changes a little bit, by and large, the amplifier doesn't care. Uh, it just keeps on doing its thing and so your your performance tends to be better and so those temperature dependent distortions and passive systems are are less likely to be a, a factor uh, we've talked a little bit about the fact that individual amplifiers are band limited uh, and that not only helps with the amplifier for the reasons we talked about earlier with clipping but it also reduces intermodulation products because if you don't have uh, frequencies to mix, they can't create intermodulation products. And then of course by by designing your crossover well, you make sure your drivers are operating in the ranges where they work well and not outside their linear regions. So these are just some of the ideas that uh, a DSP active crossover brings to the table. It's not the um, clearly the, the whole set, and but it's enough that I, I think it's pretty easy to see uh, why you would, should, should probably entertain using an active DSP crossover. The trick is just to find a provider who understands how to do that part of it well and 
the uh, technology, in my view, is has matured enough that uh, both the DSPs and the data converters have gotten very good. The software to support them has gotten very good. And the economic side of it has also fallen in such a, in, in an area where you can actually afford to do it. So this completes our first Blackboard session on DSP crossovers. This is actually the Blackboard that inspired this idea. It's uh, older than Danville. It may be, I don't know, I think this Blackboard might be 40 years old. Um, the uh, next session will be probably in about a month. We haven't picked the topic yet. If you've got an idea, please uh, drop us a, a note. You can use our talk to us on our website. This, uh, these videos are on our YouTube page or on our blog section of, of our website. Our YouTube page is just Danville Signal. Thanks for taking the time to listen in. And if you have comments, please give us a call or send us a, a chat. Thank you.